case you're about to see and the characters portrayed are fictional, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public. Ronald Dewhurst is chief witness for the prosecution in a case being tried today at Fulchester Crown Court before Mr Justice Bragg. In the months it's taken this case to come to trial, the man's injuries have made rapid progress, although he still wears a surgical collar and his right leg remains in plaster. His extensive cuts and bruises have entirely healed. In that at or about 11 p.m. on Saturday, the 23rd of July, 1977, in the car park of the Golden Fleece Public House in Fulchester, you did cause grievous bodily harm to Ronald Edward Dewhurst with intent to do him grievous bodily harm. David Miller, how say you? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. I appear for the Crown in this case, my Lord, and my learned friend Miss Dixon appears on behalf of the defence. I shall be attempting to prove in this case, beyond all reasonable doubt... Ronald Dewhurst. Right, there he goes. Get the busted now. What is your religion? CV. Take the book in your right hand, read aloud the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Ronald Dewhurst? I am. Where do you live, Mr. Dewhurst? 24 Dell Road, on the Foxton Estate in Fulchester. Would you be more comfortable sitting? Thank you very much, but I'm fine. That matters. Are you married, Mr. Dewhurst? What? No chance. How did you receive your injuries? He did it. Him in the box. Miller. He thumped me one night in the fleece car park and threw me under a car which ran over me one Saturday night last summer. Yes, can you remember clearly what happened? Yes, everything. But will you tell the court, Mr. Dewhurst, in your own words, exactly what happened that night, um, the 23rd of July, 1977. Is that the correct date? Yes, correct. Well, I'd, I'd gone to the fleece with my girlfriend, Lorraine Dilts. Like I always do for a drink and a laugh on the Saturday nights, see all his friends, because they, uh, they have a comic on. Well, we'd had a few drinks as usual, then went outside in the car park for a cuddle. Yes, what time would that be? About closing time, perhaps just before, and he were there. He, Mr. Dewhurst? Miller. Anyway, he were there, him and his wife Rita walking across. And me and Lorraine were having a laugh at some of the jokes what the comic had told, when Miller turns round and tells me to shut it. And I ought to be ashamed of myself. Ashamed of yourself? For what reason, Mr. Dewhurst? Well, for laughing at the sick jokes, what the comic could tell. Yes, and what did you reply? That I'd la laugh at what I bloody well liked, and he should mind his own business. Yes. And then what happened? Well, he just went crackers. Come for me like a madman. Lashing out with his feet and fist, he gave me a proper thumping. And then when he'd done, he threw me under a car and it ran over me. I mean, next thing I knew, I was in hospital. Now, I wonder if I could clarify a few details, Mr. Dewhurst. Your girlfriend, Miss Dilks, was present throughout your exchange of words with the accused and the assault. Yes, she was. And his wife, Rita, she were there. Ask her what happened, she'll tell you. Yes, but well, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to call Mrs. Miller as a witness for the prosecution, Mr. Dewhurst. Members of the jury, I should explain that counsel for the prosecution is unable to call Mrs. Miller simply because, in law, a spouse may not be forced to appear as a witness against the other marriage partner. Mr. Parsons? Yeah, my lord. Mr. Dewhurst, why should Mr. Miller take your laughter at the comedian's joke so amiss? Well, I, I don't really know. But he's got an handicapped kid himself. And perhaps some of the comedian's jokes upset him. Yes. Now, I want you to answer this question very carefully, Mr. Dewhurst. When, as you say, you were laughing at and even perhaps repeating some of the pub comedian's jokes in the car park, were you in any way attempting to upset or provoke Mr. Miller? No. No way. Do you know Mr. Miller well? Yeah, I've known him years. Yes. Has he ever hit you before? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stacks of times. But when I was a kid. Oh, I see. Now, uh, when Mr. Miller attacked you on the night in question, did you in any way fight back? No, never touched him. Why not? Well, he took me so sudden, flying at me like that. He just snapped, I never knew what hit me. How much did you have to drink that night? 89 pints, not a lot. Yes. Uh, was your um, behaviour or your laughter in any way exaggerated? No, not at all. Well, perhaps a bit, but not for me. I mean, I like a bit of a laugh. 
I expect I'm a bit noisy sometimes, but there's never no harm meant. I mean, I never meant to upset Dave Miller that night. Yes. Now, before the incident in question, would you have called yourself a friend of David Miller? Well, we nodded. Cool, like. We've known each other for years. We weren't exactly what you could call mates, but we were friendly enough. Everybody in the fleeces. Yes, was there any reason for the relative coolness of your friendship? Yeah, he got some crazy idea that I was after his missus. Yes, and was there any uh, reason for these suspicions? What? With the money I earn at girlfriends I've got? No chance. But you uh, do know Mrs Miller? Yeah, we grew up together. Same class at school and everything. We went out together for a time, but that was years ago. Yes. Have you had any more uh, recent contact with her? None. Except if I see her on the front with her kid, I'll say hello. Or if I bump into her in the shops. I mean, I won't ignore her, but that's all. Yes, yeah, so there's no foundation for the uh, rumours that you are perhaps fond of Mrs Miller. None at all. I mean, where he gets it from is a mystery to me. Yes. Now, Mr Dewhurst, are you prepared to tell the court um, how much you make at your trade? Anything between 150, 200 pounds a week. It just depends. Yes, so uh, you're quite capable, financially speaking, of settling down to married life if you so chose. Yes, yeah, I suppose so. Mr Dewhurst, do you have any trouble finding girlfriends? No. But you enjoy the bachelor life that you lead? Mm, very much. So it's totally by your own free choice that you are not married at this moment in time. Yeah, that's it. Dead right. Now, Mr. Dewhurst, you've told the court uh, that you and Mrs. Miller went out together, as you put it, some years ago. Uh, did you, in fact, get engaged? No, no. How close did you come to it? Talked about it. And no more? That's all. Mr. Dewhurst, do you now regret that you didn't get engaged to Mrs. Miller? No. Why did you finally not get engaged to her? Well, it suddenly struck me at 21, I mean, which we both were at that time, that neither of us were ready for wedding bells. Yes. Now, are you now? Well, no chance, but... Yes, Mr. Dewar? Uh, well, I mean, she obviously was, I mean, because she married him just after. Mm, good luck to her. Mr. Dewar, do you uh, now regret that you didn't marry Mrs. Miller? No. Thank you, Mr. Dewhurst. <clears throat> Mr. Dewhurst, would you tell us precisely how many times David Miller hit you that night in the Golden Fleece car park? I don't know. I wasn't counting. I don't think he hit you more than once before the fight was over. Once? He hit me damn sight more than once. And then he threw me under the car. I mean, if all he did was hit me once, how did I get like this? You got those injuries under a car... Yes, what he threw me under. How much had you had to drink when the accused hit you? Eight pints. Eight pints? Well, nine then. I mean, I wasn't counting. I mean, I wasn't drunk or anything like. So don't be thinking that I was. Can you really claim to be clear about events on that night when you had had so much to drink? Yes, eight pints is nothing for me. I mean, I can remember it all as clear as daylight. He hit me over and over again and they threw me under a car. You can ask Lorraine. Clear as daylight. But had not most of the electric lights in the car park, including the area where all this took place, been vandalised? Yes, yeah, suppose so. So in the dark, and with eight or nine pints inside, do you want the jury to accept that you are perfectly clear about events in this case? Clear as daylight, to use your own words? Yes. Thank you. That is what I want to make clear. Now, Mr. Dewhurst, are you equally clear that David Miller threw you under a car? Yes, he picked me up and threw me under a car that was reversing. He didn't roll you, <coughs> or trip you, or, or simply push you. He literally threw you. Yes. You're a big lad, Mr. Dewhurst. How much do you weigh? Fourteen and a half stone. Now, that's quite a weight to pick up off the ground. I take it you, you were lying on the ground after the rain of blows from the accused, which you remember so clearly? Well, I, I must have been. I see. You've told the court, and I quote, he gave me a proper thumping. When he'd done, he picked me up and threw me under a car. He didn't roll or push you, he threw you. Is it really possible to pick up a, a dead weight and bulk like yours off the ground? Well, he could do it. I'll just have a look at him. It's easy. Fourteen and a half stone. Oh, now, come now, Mr. Dewhurst, it isn't as if your prone body were conveniently arranged for picking up. Well, I wouldn't know about that, but it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. 
Mr Dewhurst, I suggest that you set out all evening to provoke David Miller, ending up with one extremely cruel insult in the car park. Never. I never did. And I put it to you that you were deliberately needling David Miller, hoping perhaps to pick a fight which you expected to win. Oh, rubbish, Paul, rubbish. Mr Dewhurst, you must not address counsel in a familiar manner. I'm sorry, my lord. Is it not true, Mr Dewhurst, that on at least two occasions that night in the Golden Fleece pub, before you ever got to the car park, you went out of your way to insult the defendant? Rubbish. What do you mean? Did you speak to the defendant before the incident in the car park? No, not really. Really? Well, did you pay your dues to your local fishing club on that same night? I'm not sure. Perhaps I did. You certainly did. I intend calling the secretary of the local fishing club, my lord, who will confirm that fact. While you were waiting in the queue to pay your dues, did you see anybody that you knew? Yes. I knew most of them. Was the defendant in the queue? Yeah, I saw Dave Miller. Did you say anything to him? How do? All right, Dave. Things like that. I honestly can't remember more. Was there another incident while you were waiting to be served at the bar? Yeah, definitely. Dave Miller pushed in and I told him to wait his turn like anybody else. How did you tell him? Well, I had to tell him pretty sharp because he pushed in heavy. So your manner didn't exactly calm the situation? Well, I don't suppose it did, but he asked for it. I see. How would you describe your laughter over sick jokes in front of the defendant, the father of a handicapped child? Did you not deliberately try to give offence to him? No, not deliberate. It's just that I've got a big laugh. Or so people tell me. Anyway, I like sick jokes. Might not be everybody's cup of tea, but I like them. I mean, I didn't know he was listening to me laughing, did I? Didn't you? You've told the court earlier that you saw the accused just in front of you and your girlfriend in the car park. Would it not have been tactful to restrain your laughter knowing the defendant and his wife as you do? Well, I, I saw him in Rita, but I didn't really take notice. I mean, we'd had a good time and a lot to drink and I was on my way for a cuddle. Did you not say to the accused something like, come on, cocky, let's have you. You're going to get it now and you're not turning your back on me this time. <laughs> Never. I believe that you did. And I further believe that your actions stemmed in part from an unwelcome infatuation with his wife. What do you say to that? Well, I say it's rubbish. Prove it. I intend to. You told the court earlier that you often saw Mrs Miller alone, round the front of her house, at the shops and so on. That's right. Have you ever rung her up at home? Yeah, once or twice. Was she always alone when you rang? How do I know? I mean, how do I know whether he was in or not? She was the only one I ever spoke to. Were you aware that Mr. Miller regularly worked night shifts? Well, yeah, I suppose so. So it wouldn't have been entirely unexpected if you had spoken to Mrs. Miller rather than her husband, if you chose your week carefully. What do you do for a living, Mr. Dewhurst? I'm a self-employed scaffolder, when I can get to work. That sounds like a job calling for quite a bit of physical strength. Well, there's some big lads in my game, that's true. Are you able to stand up to the work? Yes, when I'm fit. Are you able to stand up for yourself at work? In fights, for instance? I, I take it fights are not unknown in your trade. Uh, my, my learned friend is implying, quite unfairly <coughs> in my opinion, that those employed in scaffolding are prone to violence. Quite so, Mr Parsons. The jury will disregard the last question. <coughs> Continue, Mr Dixon. My lord. If my client attacked you in the car park, and if, as you have told us, you were nowhere near drunk, why didn't you defend yourself? Well, because he took me so sudden, that's why I didn't have time to think. Hey, and don't let Miller fool you. He might be quiet enough now, and he might never have got caught. Resist out plenty of thumping this time, I can tell you that. Just answer the questions that are put to you, Mr Dewhurst. Mr Dewhurst, I think the real reason for your not hitting back at Mr Miller was that his wife placed herself between you and him when it all started. No, that's rubbish. There was nothing I could do. Ask Lorraine. He was kicking and butting and everything. That's Rita. I suggest to you that far from the defendant throwing you under a car, 
You blundered into the rear of a reversing car and sustained your injuries that way. No wrong. Not so. That's Lorraine. That's me. Do you all see? Now, Mr. Dewhurst, you have told the court that uh, you and Mrs. Miller were once nearly engaged. That's right. So what? Well, people usually feel pretty close to each other to get engaged. Were you close to Rita Smallwood, as she was then? What, six years ago? I suppose I was, but that's over. I wonder if it is. Look, as it's far finished with. She's got her life and I've got mine. Do you ever think about Rita Smallwood, Rita Miller, nowadays? Sometimes. No, there's no point. Do you deny that you have had strong feelings for her in the past? Well, I can't, can I? Do you deny that you had these feelings for a number of years, from the time of the near engagement and before? No. Do you deny that you still find her a highly attractive woman? Have you been over-familiar with Mrs Miller recently? No, that's just me. I'm like that with everybody. Do you phone everybody in the middle of the night? No. Do you feel that Mrs Miller, married to a man 17 years her senior, is, is somehow wasted on him? <laughs> well, that's not for me to say. Oh, I think it is. Oh, well, all right then. Sometimes I think she is. Do you deny that sometimes you feel that you and Mrs Miller could have been happy together? Well, there's no point, is there? He looks after her, and good luck to them both. I suggest that your feelings towards Mrs Miller, along with the incident at the bar which you've described, drove you to pick a fight with her husband. Wrong. Not true. And when you lose that fight and are severely injured in a totally unconnected car accident, you choose to try and blame, put all the blame on David Miller. Now, is that not the truth? No, you're completely wrong. That's all untrue. Lorraine Dilts. Calling Lorraine Dilts. What is your religion? Uh, CV. Take the book in your right hand, read aloud the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You are Lorraine Dilks? Yeah. Of uh, 14 Nelson Terrace Fulcher Star. That's right. Now, one moment, Mr. Parsons, Miss Dilks. Are you chewing gum? Oh, uh, yeah. Would you kindly dispose of it? My lord. Now, Miss Dills, were you uh, with Ronald Dewhurst on the night of the 23rd of July last? Yeah. I called for him at his mother's and then we went to the fleece. Yes. What did you do there? What we always did. Had some drinks, watched a comic, met some friends. Yes. And then what happened? Well, when the comic had finished his spot, we went outside, me and Ronnie. Yes, what for? To go in the car park, in the dark. What for? Well, you know, a kiss and that. I see. And uh, what happened? Well, we never got there. That gorilla, he heard us laughing, and he come and thumped poor Ronnie, something awful. And when he'd done, not happy with just kicking him on the ground, he picked him up and sort of threw him under this car that we're reversing. You saw everything clearly? I oh, were right there, weren't I, on top of it all? Yes, so there's no doubt at all in your mind exactly what happened. Clear as daylight. Thank you, Miss Jokes. Now, tell me, why were you and uh, Mr. Dewhurst laughing? At the pub turn, the comic. We'd just come out, we were still laughing. Uh, were you laughing at uh, Mr. Miller then and his wife? No way. Why then should Mr. Miller take this laughing so amiss? Why should he attack Mr. Dewhurst so ferociously? Because he's funny and touchy, that's why. Everybody knows him near us. Used to be a right tear away. Yes, is there any other reason, in your opinion, why uh, Mr. Miller should get so excited? Well, they've got this handicapped kid. I don't suppose he thinks it's a joke, even if other people do. Yes, but was your laughter in the car park that evening directed at Mr. Miller or any member of his family? Of course not. Why then should Mr. Miller fly at Mr. Dewhurst? Because he kids himself that Ronnie's keen on his wife. No. Oh. Now, have you any reason to think this is so? Don't be daft, of course he's not keen on her. I should know. So you're completely satisfied, Miss Dills, that when Mr. Miller attacked Mr. Dewhurst at the car park that night, it is entirely without provocation from Mr. Dewhurst or yourself? Positive. 
Miss Dilks, did you know that Mr. Dewhurst has been phoning Mrs. Miller in the middle of the night when her husband was on night shift? I don't believe you. Would you believe Mr. Dewhurst if he told you so? Well, yeah, I suppose so. Do you believe everything he tells you? Well, most... Th no. Do you do everything he tells you? No. When he says, come into the car park for a cuddle, do you go? No. You did on the night in question. Well, it was Saturday. Oh, I see. Saturday is all right, but uh, never on a Sunday or, as today, a Tuesday. Have you known Ronald Dewhurst long? Quite a while, just over a year. Would you say you're close to him? Pretty close. Are you lovers? My Lord, how relevant is this? Miss Dixon? I feel it is relevant, my Lord. I am trying to establish the loyalties and therefore the independence of this witness. Perfectly fair. Continue, Miss Dixon. Well, Miss Dilks, are you lovers? Yeah, but it's none of your business. Do you feel it gives you the place in Ronald Dewhurst's heart that Rita Miller once had and perhaps still has? <laughs> my Lord, I protest. How can this witness or any witness be asked to answer for someone else? Surely only Ronald Dewhurst can answer their question. Yes, I agree, Mr. Parson. My Lord. Now, Miss Dilks, the night in question, you've told us that you were present and that you saw and heard everything that happened in the Golden Fleece car park from about closing time onwards. Yes. You said that you saw everything, I quote, clear as daylight. Yeah. By a remarkable coincidence, Ronald Dewhurst used that self-same phrase in his evidence while you were waiting outside. Still, no, no real matter. How could you see as clear as daylight when the lights in that part of the car park, in most of the car park, had been vandalised? All right, it were pretty dark, but I could see clear enough. And there's no mistake in him, Miller. He's massive. There were light enough for that. So, Miller hit Ronnie Dewhurst once, and then what happened? Once? He went for him like a madman. He hit him lots of times. Two people will say he hit him only once. Yeah. Miller himself and his wife. What do you expect them to say? I ask myself what I can expect you to say, Miss Dilks. Now, after Mr. Miller hit Ronnie Dewhurst, what happened? He picked him up and threw him under a car. Picked him up and threw him? That's right. Now, Ronnie is a big lad, Miss Dilks. Fourteen and a half stone. Is it really possible to pick up such a weight off the ground and throw it under a car? Well, not for somebody normal, no. But Miller could do it. He's strong enough easy. Just look at him. Join us again tomorrow when the case of the Queen against Miller will be resumed in the Crown Court. The case you're about to see and the characters portrayed are fictional, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public. David Miller is accused of causing grievous bodily harm to Ronnie Dewhurst, who, several years ago, was once his wife's boyfriend. Dewhurst and his current girlfriend, Lorraine Dilks, have both been giving evidence about the alleged attack in the Golden Fleece pub car park. You are Dr. Caroline Williams? I am. What are your qualifications, Doctor? I graduated MBCHB from Edinburgh in 1968 and I'm at present registrar in the casualty department of Fulchester General Hospital. Yes, were you on duty there on the night of July the 23rd last? I was. And did you treat Ronald Dewhurst for certain injuries? Yes. Can you describe those injuries for us, please, Doctor? Mr. Dewhurst was admitted to the casualty department at about 11.45 p.m. His injuries were severe and his life was in some danger, partly through the ingestion of his own vomit and he needed urgent treatment. A 
Upon examination, I found that Mr. Dewhurst had suffered a compound fracture to the right tibia and fibula, a simple fracture of the left femur. He had a fractured pelvis, and there was damage to several of the spinal vertebrae. He had extensive cuts and bruises. Yes. Now, what treatment did you give him? We cleared his lungs of obstruction, cleaned up the cuts and bruises, and after the x-rays, put him into plaster. He was admitted that night. Yes. Will Mr. Dewhurst eventually recover from those injuries? Oh, not completely, no. Uh, there's likely to be a degree of permanent impairment. He'll have a limp, and his back will give him pain for the rest of his life. Yes. Very serious injuries, though. Yes. Doctor, how would you say Dewhurst came by these injuries? My information was that he'd been run over by a car. His injuries were certainly consistent with that. Was there any indication when you examined Dewhurst that he could have sustained any injuries of any kind before being hit by a car? Impossible for me to say. All I can say for certain is that his injuries were consistent with having been hit by a car. Was it possible for you to tell whether Dewhurst had been drinking that evening before being brought to the hospital? Yes, I should say he had. A lot? A large quantity of beer? I should say that it was beer that he'd been drinking, but it's quite impossible for me to state or even estimate how much. I was too busy on the night to take any samples which might have given a reliable indication. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I hope we haven't taken up too much of your valuable time. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Glover, since there may be proceedings against you in another court as a result of this accident, I must caution you before you give evidence that you're not obliged to answer any questions which you feel could incriminate you in any way in any such possible future proceedings. Now, if you wish to exercise this right, all you need do is simply say that you refuse to answer. Now, do you understand that? Yes, thank you. Now, Mr. Glover, what is your recollection of the events of that night, July the 23rd last? Well, I'd had three halves of bitter, so just before closing, I'd gone to fetch the car from the far end of the car park. Yes. Then what happened? Well, I was reversing carefully down a line of cars, threading my way, when all of a sudden I felt a bang and a bump as if I'd run over something. I, I stopped, and there was Mr. Dewhurst lying under the car, and Miss Dilts there screaming her head off. Yes. What did you do? Well, I ran and phoned for an ambulance in the pub. How did you know it was Mr. Dewhurst? Well, I didn't at the time. I, I'd not been in that pub before. I've got to know later. Yes. Have you ever seen uh, the accused before? No, never. Yes. Now, on your way to the car, or whilst you were driving it in the car park, did you hear or see any signs of a disturbance? No, nothing, I don't think. Quite sure? No, I don't think so. I mean, there could have been something going on in the car park. It's a big car park, but I didn't see anything. I, I was in the car. I couldn't have seen anything. I see. Now, tell me, so far as you can judge, uh, would it have been possible for someone to wander under your reversing car accidentally? Shouldn't think so. No. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover, is your car fitted with reversing lights? No. On the night in question, were all its normal rear lights in working order? Uh, yes, I think so. I can't be sure. Well, I can't be 100% sure, no, but, but I think they were. What colour is your car? Navy blue. Was the car park lit? Some of the lights had been smashed. Oh, you noticed specially? No, not specially, but I did notice. So, in a car with no reversing lights, with no guarantee that the normal rear lights were working, in a car colour navy blue, on a dark night, in a car park with vandalised lamps. Would it be possible for Mr Dewhurst not to see you as you were reversing? I suppose you could be right. What speed were you doing at the moment of impact? Oh, impossible to say. I was looking behind, not at the speedo. Well, do you often go fast? Sometimes, yes. In all gears, even reverse? Mr Glover, let me put this scene to you and ask you to make your comments afterwards. I put it to you that on the night in question, you were reversing in the Golden Fleece car park at speed. Your car was difficult to see for a, a number of reasons. You were going at a speed that was ill-advised, to say the least, and a man 
stepped out into your path from behind another car. Now, you could not possibly have seen him. You hit him and caused him the injuries that the court has heard described. You stopped and did what you could. Is this not the truth of the events of that night, as you had a part in them? I refuse to answer. Final point, Mr. Glover. Once you had stopped the car after the impact with Mr. Dewhurst, did you see or hear anybody else in the vicinity of the accident? Only Miss Dilks, the young woman there. She was screaming. He was lying under the car and she was screaming. You neither saw nor heard anybody else there or moving away? Well, all my attention was on Mr. Dewhurst, those awful screams. I can't say one way or the other whether there was anybody there apart from those two. Say, from where you were behind the bar, you saw every detail of the argument between the accused and Mr. Dewhurst. Oh, yes, everything. Yes, will you describe it to the court, Mrs. Matron? Well, Ronnie Dewhurst was standing by the bar, and I was just going to serve him, when suddenly he sort of pressed forward. I think he got a push in the back. Go on. Well, then I saw that Miller behind Ronnie. He seemed to be holding Ronnie's suit and like spitting words into his ear. Yes, what was he saying? Well, I couldn't catch everything that was said, just the odd words we was busy see. But I did hear him, the one in the dock, say, Rita, that's his wife, and keep away and tell you again or shan't tell you again. Yes, now, in your opinion, was Mr... Miller's manner menacing? Oh, ever so threatening. Yes. I see. Now, Mr. Miller was talking to Mr. Jewish about his wife. You definitely heard the word Rita mentioned. Oh, definitely. And I'll tell you something else. I've often seen her, Rita, making eyes at Ronnie on the quiet. Really? Yes. Well, I'll come back to that in a moment, if I may. But tell the court, Mrs. Mitchell, how did Mr. Dewhurst react to what you saw as threats made to him by the accused? Oh, he laughed. Ronnie's not one to take bluster and bullshit... ..rubbish. Seriously. Yes. Now, Mrs. Mitchell, you've worked at the Golden Police for some time, I believe. Oh, I've been there years. Yes. Would you say that you knew everyone who went in there? Oh, just about. There's not a lot I miss. Yes, I'm sure. Now, you said a short while ago that she, uh, that is, uh, Mrs. Miller, had often made eyes at Ronald Dewhurst. Can you explain that for us? Well, you know what I mean. You can't expect two people, what's been as close as them two, to forget each other just like that, because she goes and gets married. Oh, surely, my lord, this is a court of law, not the snug at the Golden Fleece. Mrs. Machen, generalizations are not helpful to the court. Well, you could see them looking at each other every now and then, behind his back, especially her at him. Ooh, they were ever so thick when they were courting, laughing, holding hands, right pair of lovebirds. Ever such a surprise it was when suddenly it's all over and she's off and marries him all in five minutes. Is Mr. Dewhurst Ronnie? A regular at the Golden Fleece? Oh, yes. He's in most nights. Would you say he's a popular person? Oh, yes. Why is that? Oh, well, he's always got a smile and a joke. And he'd buy you a drink, too, most willingly. And he's always cheerful about it, too. Unlike Mr. Miller, uh, the accused. Oh, not like him at all. How would you describe Mr. Miller from what you've seen at the Golden Fleece? Well, he doesn't come in that often, only on Saturdays with that wife of his. And then he doesn't speak to you much. He just orders his beer, keeps himself to himself. From what I've seen, he doesn't talk to nobody much. Anything else? Well, he does seem to be a bit watchful. That wife of his, you know, there's a bit of a gap between their ages. And to me, it seems somehow as though he doesn't trust her. Does Mr. Miller, the accused, ever buy you a drink, for instance? Oh, not him. Never yet. And never a joke or a laugh? No, neither. Unlike Ronnie, Mr. Dewhurst. Oh, different as chalk and cheese. <laughs> you like Ronnie quite a lot, don't you? Oh, yes. Not that David Miller, though, eh? 
No, not really. In fact, you like Dewhurst so much, and the defendant and his wife so little, that everything you have said so far is totally biased. Isn't that so? What is your religion? C of E. Take the book in your right hand, read aloud the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Would you tell the court how long you have been married? Six years. How old when you, were you when you married, and how old was your wife? I was 38, she was 21. Has this age difference ever caused you any concern? Never given it a moment's thought, nor has Rita. Are you sure about that? Perfectly sure. Would you say yours is a happy marriage? Ideal. We're very happy, both of us. Have you any children? One daughter, five. Would you tell the court about your daughter? She was born spina bifida. She's handicapped both mentally and physically. Do you know Ronnie Dewhurst? I do. Do you know him well? I've known him all my life. What do you think of him? I don't like him much. As far as I'm concerned, he's spoilt, selfish and noisy. He never grown up. Has there been bad feeling between you? Oh, yes. <coughs> Tell us. Well, I were always giving him a clip round the ear hole when he were a kid for cheeking me. Not that it made any difference. And there's been time since. Would you give us an example? Well, I had to speak to him about phoning Rita up at two o'clock in the morning when I were on nights. Uh, when would that be? Um, a week before the night it all happened. She told me about it. And when did you speak to him about this? As soon as I could that Saturday night in pub. She told me about it, but I were on nights. So I spoke to him as soon as I could. I take it that was at the bar, as has been described by Mrs Machen. <laughs> Was your behaviour with him in any way unusual? Oh, yes. I had hold of him. Why was that? Well, somebody, I don't know who it was, had pushed me into him. There's people about think me and him's a pair of comedians out to entertain him. Anyway, I, I grabbed hold of him to stop myself falling. Didn't make no odds. What do you mean? Well, I knew I'd have to speak to him pretty clear. I mean, he's like that. He thinks everything's a joke. So I thought, well, now's as good a time as any. So I spoke to him there at the bar. But what did you tell him? To stop making bloody silly phone calls to my wife at two o'clock in the morning, to leave her alone, and I wouldn't tell him again. How did he react? He laughed. I knew he would. And what did you do? Nothing. I, I told him we're on a warning to leave her alone. If he did it again, he were for it. I know I'm not doing my case any good, but I might as well tell you, I'm not a bit surprised I had to thump him later. Why? Well, he's like that. He never listens to a word anybody ever says to him. You can ask anybody. Later that evening, did you deliberately go out of your way to thump Dewhurst? No, I never said that, and that's not what happened. It's just that, well, I've known him all my life, and I knew after that in the bar, well, he'd come looking for trouble and I'd have to thump him. And that is what happened? Yes. Describe it to us, fully. Well, I didn't see him again at the bar. Heard him a lot, though, laughing. I didn't see him until me and Rita were walking across car parked at Fish and Chip Shop. Just before time. We left a bit early because of that disgusting comedian telling all them sick jokes and what with us were the... Well, I didn't think Rita should sit and listen to all that, so I said we should go. And there he were in car park with his girlfriend. He was laughing and shooting his mouth off. And what did he say to you? Say, shout more like. He said, uh, who's an old man then? Uh, who's gonna thump me? You chucked yourself away on him, didn't you? Uh, that were to Rita. Things like that. And you hit him? No. Not until he said... Don't have any more kids with someone as old as him. You know what happened last time. 
Those were his exact words. That's exactly what he said. Is it your view that he set out deliberately to provoke you? Of course it is. What do you think? Indeed. And you hit him? Yes. I hit him once. Rita stepped between us. I walked away. And she followed. Now, let me get this clear. You hit him once only and then walked on? Yes. Did you assault Dewhurst in any other way? No. You didn't push him or throw him under a car that was reversing? No, I didn't see a car or hear one. As far as you are concerned, that one blow you gave Dewhurst started and finished the fight? Yes, I hit him once, Rita came between us, I walked away and that were that. Does that complete your account of the events of that evening? Yes, I think so. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Hmm. <clears throat> Mr. Miller, you are no stranger to violence, are you? What do you mean? Well, I mean several things. Uh, first of all, the witnesses told this court that you were once a right tearaway. What do you make of that? I were a bit handy in my teens once, but I, I never got into no trouble. And I did grow out of it, unlike some. Anyway, that were donkey's years sin. Not only that, you have told us yourself that you fully expected to hit Dewhurst that Saturday night. Yes, I did. You know, Mr. Miller, I feel that what's at the bottom of this case is jealousy. The jealousy of an older man married to a much younger, very attractive wife uh, for a young man with plenty of money in his pocket and away with the ladies. What do you say to that? Rubbish. I've no time for jealousy. Mm -hmm. What do you think uh, your wife thinks about Ronald Dewhurst? Much the same as me, but you'll have to ask her. I shall. I mean, you knew, didn't you, that your wife was once nearly engaged to Ronald Dewhurst? Of course I did. There's no secret about it. Yes. I'll ask you something else, Mr. Miller. Do you feel that a young, attractive wife such as yours can be content that her husband is so frequently on the night shift, working antisocial hours? What do you mean? Well, I mean, Mr. Miller, that here we have a young, attractive wife who many think might be leading a rather humdrum existence. I wonder what impact this has on you and your relationship to Ronald Dewhurst. You're talking out the top of your head. He means nothing to her. My Lord, I wonder if you could persuade my learned friend to excuse the court all this amateur marital psychology. Unless, of course, he has concrete proof of a rift between the defendant and his wife. Mr. Parsons? Well, I think the point is relevant, my Lord. We've heard very little of the relationship between Mr. and Mrs. Miller so far, crucial though this is. Proceed. Thank you, my Lord. Mr. Miller, would you say that your wife entirely rejected the little attentions an old friend like Mr. Dewhurst occasionally paid her? She told me she did. Yes, well, I should think she hardly had any alternative. Look, he kept pestering her. She told me about it, asked me to stop him, and I did all right. Yes, you stopped him all right. Out of jealousy for a younger man, you assaulted him in the car park and then threw him under a moving car. Strong, are you, Mr. Miller? Strong enough, and I never did what you just said. Strong enough to pick up Ronald Dewhurst? I don't know. I've never tried. Well, from looking at you, I would say that you certainly could. Did you have a lot to drink uh, by the time you got into the car park on the night in question? No. Five pints. What effect do five pints have on you? Nothing. Do they make you aggressive, brutal? Well, I'm one for the quiet life. You can ask me wife. I shall. You see, what I'm getting at, Mr. Miller, is this. There you are, a lovely young wife in your arm. You've had a few drinks, and of all people, you come across Ronald Dewhurst in the car park, laughing and cuddling with his girlfriend. He laughs, perhaps, a bit too loud. And you fly into a vicious rage, and he ends up with the terrible injuries we've heard described. Compound fracture to the right tibia and fibula, Fracture of the left femur, fractured pelvis, damage to several spinal vertebrae. Numerous cuts and bruises. He's talking nonsense. Well, let us come to the facts, then, of this assault. Did you hit Ronald Dewhurst in the car park? 
Yes, I've told you once. Now, why just once? Rita stepped between us. You can ask her. How hard did you hit Mr. Dewhurst? As hard as I could. As hard as you could? He asked for it. How hard was that? Ela felt it. <laughs> yes, I'm sure he did. Did Mr. Dewhurst hit you? No. No, and I'll tell you why. Because you had flattened him with a rain of blows that no one could have stood up to. Now, you're not seriously asking this court to believe that he sustained those injuries from this one blow you gave him. Look, I'll tell you again, I hit him once, then Rita stepped between us. If she hadn't been there, he would have hit me. And he got his injuries from a car he walked under, a, a fell under. I don't know, I didn't see it. I, I wasn't there. It went out to do with me, it had gone home. So you never saw this car that he fell under? No. Or heard this car that he walked under? No, I didn't see or hear nothing. Now, you're a big, powerful man, Mr. Miller. How much can you lift? I don't know, I've never measured it. Could you lift Ronald Dewhurst? Perhaps I could, I've never tried. Could you lift Ronald Dewhurst? Yeah. Off the floor? I don't know. Could you lift Ronald Dewhurst off the ground? Yeah, perhaps I could, yeah. <clears throat> Did you throw him under a moving car in the car park of the Feast Public House that night? No. Have you ever felt like throwing him under a moving car? Yes. No, no. That's not what happened. It doesn't matter what I felt like, I did not throw him under a moving car. I've told you, I hit him once. Rita stepped between us, and then I walked off, and that was that. Is that it, Mr. Miller? You are asking this court to believe that in all this anger, you hit him as hard as I could, but that your wife, in one step, was able to quench this uncontrolled rage? I suggest to you that the dark of that car park gave you a chance at last to deal with Ronald Dewhurst in any way you chose, and that the jealousy and violence in your nature erupted so much so that you were able to pick him up and throw him under a reversing car, thereby cruelly altering his normal way of life. Join us again tomorrow when the case of the Queen against Miller will be concluded in the Crown Court. The case you're about to see and the characters portrayed are fictional, but the procedure is legally accurate. The characters are played by actors, but the jury is selected from members of the general public, who will retire at the end of the trial to reach their own unrehearsed verdict. David Miller has admitted hitting Ronnie Dewhurst in the Golden Fleece pub car park. He's accused of causing him grievous bodily harm. Today we shall hear the evidence of Miller's wife Rita, formerly Ronnie Dewhurst's girlfriend. You are Bernard Harrison, secretary of the fishing club at the Golden Fleece Public House at Foxton, Fulchester. I am. Do you know the defendant, David Miller? Yes, I've known him for years. How would you describe Mr Miller? Well, he's a very quiet sort of bloke. Keeps himself to himself, you know. Never any sort of trouble in the pub or on, on the fishing trips that you organise? Oh, no, never. Does Ronnie Dewhurst come on your trips? Oh, I. Never missed one before his accident. It's not quite the same without Ronnie. Were you collecting money for a fishing trip on the evening of Saturday, the 23rd of July last? Uh, yes. Would you kindly describe to the court what happened? Oh, it was like a madhouse. People never pay their dues or their subs until the last minute. Never look at notices. So I'm busy taking the money. I've got a rush on, like, when suddenly I hear Ronnie shout from the back of the queue, Hey, Bernard, is this queue for the pensioners' trip? So I said, no, why? What did you understand by such a question? Well, Dave Miller was in the queue, and Ronnie's always kidding him, at least 
when we've been on fishing trips. What happened next? Dave Miller said, no, it isn't. And it isn't the kids' queue either. So what are you doing in it? Well, everybody laughed like. And then Ronnie shouted, you come down here and say that. What was David Miller's reply? Oh, he ignored him. He always does. Was there a suggestion of public fun being made of David Miller? Not specially. Not specially? Well, he's like that, Ronnie. It's his way. He pulls everybody's leg. But especially David Miller's? I'm not sure. Have you been present at any other leg pullings, as you call them, by Ronnie Dewhurst, directed against David Miller? I never take much notice. Well, say, involving David Miller's wife, Rita. Oh, not personally. But I have heard, like, that there's uh, something... Uh, uh, my Lord, this is hearsay. I'm afraid so, Miss Dixon. I'm obliged, my Lord. Mm. Mr Harrison, have there been occasions in the past when you have personally seen Ronald Dewhurst take the initiative in stirring things up with David Miller, or, or pulling his leg, as you might prefer to call it? Yes. Now you have said that you were especially busy with a large queue on the night of the 23rd of July. Yes, true. Yes. So it must have been noisy. It must have been hard for you to make a detailed note of what anyone said who was not directly in front of you at the payments table. Yes, I suppose it would. Well, can you therefore be certain as to what was said between Mr Miller and Mr Dewhurst and all that hubbub? Well, I can't be 100% like. But I think it's something like what I've said. I see. Well, let me move to another point where your memory may be a little more reliable, Mr. Harris. Now, tell me, on these fishing trips of yours, is there not a lot of banter, a lot of leg pulling goes on among the men? Oh, all the time. Yes. Does David Miller ever take part in this harmless fun? No. He never says very much, unless he's spoken to. Somebody else has to start it first. Yes. Uh, would you say he was a bit of a withdrawn character, a bit antisocial, a bit of a sourpuss? I, I couldn't really say. Or is it that you would rather not say? Now, uh, let us talk about Ronald Dewhurst and what you uh, have seen of him. How does his behaviour strike you on these fishing trips? Oh, life and soul of the party. Always a laugh with Ronnie. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. You may stand down, Mr. Harrison. This is Miller. What is your religion? See Take the book in your right hand, read aloud the words on the card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, could you speak up, please, Mrs Miller, so that the jury can hear you? You are Rita Miller, wife of the defendant. Yes. How long have you been married to David Miller? Six years. Have they been happy years? He's a good husband. You have a handicapped daughter, Tracy. Yes. He's a marvellous father with her. In what way? Well, you know, nothing's too much trouble for him. He works all the hours God, God gives to get enough money to make, to buy things for her. She's short of nothing. How does he treat you? He's a good husband. And no more? What more does any woman want? Indeed. And you can say, can you, with complete conviction that yours is a happy marriage? Yes. And that neither the fact of your handicapped daughter nor the difference in ages between your husband and yourself causes any difficulty whatsoever? No. Absolutely sure? Yes. Would you like to describe to the court your life with your husband and daughter? Well, it's not easy, of course. She's handicapped. But David helps as much as he can when he's home. And she loves us very much. And we love her. Do you love each other? Me and David? Yes. Have you known Ronald Dewhurst long? All my life. 
We went through school together, same class, and then... Yes? We were courting. But that courtship ended? Yes. I ended it. Why? Ronnie got to talking about getting engaged, and I didn't want that. Why not? I wasn't sure what kind of a husband he'd make, and I just got to wondering, even though getting engaged was his idea, well, whether he was serious. Can you tell us more? I just wondered if he'd ever grow up, that's all. How did you Hurst, take your decision? Didn't like it. I see. Well, since that time, have you at any moment encouraged Dewhurst to think that you regretted your decision or, or were willing to think of him in any unwifely way? No. Dewhurst, for his part, has he approached you? No, not really. Well, has he rung you up while your husband was at work at two o'clock in the morning? Yes. What did he want? He wanted me to meet him. What did you tell him? I told him I couldn't. Did you want to? No. Has he contacted you at any other time? No. Have you ever given him any encouragement, any reason to hope? In fact, have you any reason to think that Ronnie Dewhurst still has feelings for you? I don't know. Shouldn't think so. Would you describe events that took place in the Golden Fleece car park on the night of the 23rd of July last? Well, we had a few drinks and we listened to this comic. It wasn't very good, so we came out to go to chip shop. Yes, go on. We were crossing the car park and we heard Ronnie laughing with his girlfriend. Could you see him? No. Kids had broken some of the lamps. But you knew it was him? Oh, yes. I see. Then what happened? Well, we came up to them and then Dave and Ronnie started shouting at each other. Then David hit Ronnie and... I ran between them and it stopped. How many times did your husband hit Mr. Dewhurst? Once. You are sure? Yes. Did Mr. Dewhurst hit your husband? No, I stopped it. Why should your husband hit him? I don't know. Something he said. What did Dewhurst say to your husband? I can't really say. It was all over so quick and they were shouting. Was it something about you and your husband and your handicapped daughter? Could have been. I don't know. Well, did Dewhurst say something like, don't have any more kids by him, Rita? Look what happened last time. It was all over so quick and they were shouting. So you really can't say? Could have done. I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. That's all right, Mrs. Miller. During all this, did you see Lorraine Dilks, the girlfriend of Ronnie Dewhurst? She were there. Now, what happened next after your husband hit Dewhurst the once and you stepped in between them? We went straight home to my mother and Tracy. Went straight home? Quite sure? Certain. Did you see or hear a car reversing rapidly in the car park? Didn't see any cars. It was quiet. So your husband couldn't possibly have picked Dewhurst up and thrown him under a car at all? No, we couldn't. You're quite sure that your husband had no more to do with Dewhurst after striking him the one blow and that he had nothing at all in any way to do with the injuries Dewhurst sustained under a car in the car park? David had nothing to do with it. The first either of us knew anything about it was when a policeman came and knocked us up. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Now, you know the full extent of Ronald Dewhurst's injuries, do you, Mrs. Miller? Yes. Broken thigh, smashed leg, fractured pelvis. Spinal injuries, to say nothing of cuts and bruises. He'll never be the same again, you know. I know. How do you feel about that? Sorry. Yes, I'm sure you are. Now, you don't seriously ask the court to believe that these injuries were sustained by this one blow you claim your husband gave him? 
I saw David at him just once. Just once? Not time and time again as two people have already described to this court. David at him just once, then I stepped between them. Now, Mrs. Miller, Mr. Jewhurst claims that after your husband beat him to the ground, he then picked him up and threw him under a reversing car. I didn't see or hear any car. David hit Ronnie just once, and then we walked away. That's the truth. I put something else to you, Mrs. Miller. We've heard you describe in some detail how you live as a married woman. Now, from what you've said, would I be right to describe your married life now as dull, hard work and not much else? Partly, I suppose. Only partly. All right, then, more than partly. Mrs. Miller, wouldn't you say that you've changed since you were married? We none of us stay the same. Quite so. Now, answer my question. All right, then, yes. yes. I've changed. In what way? I used to be livelier. You used to be livelier, is that all? We're only young once. Why not you and Ronald Dewhurst, together known as the life and soul of every party? In fact, weren't you pretty close to Ronald Dewhurst in those days? Weren't you inseparable? Yes, then. A deal closer than holding hands and talking about engagement. If the truth were known, Mrs. Miller, weren't you and Ronald Dewhurst lovers? in the full sense of that word. Mrs. Miller, wouldn't you say that there has existed between you and Ronald Dewhurst a bond of a sort you now find it difficult to forget? Yes. And that this bond still exists? I'm a married woman. And that neither Ronald Dewhurst or yourself can ignore it? I love my husband. Well, I think the court and the jury will take your meaning, Mrs. Miller. I put it to you that your husband, David, is no more able than yourself to forget the bond that exists between you and Ronald Dewhurst. David knows we were engaged, or nearly. I suggest your husband's life is affected by it, to the point where he might even commit a serious crime over it. No, he's not like that. Well, what is he like, Mrs. Miller? He's already told us himself he's strong and experienced, though some years ago, in matters of violence. Several witnesses have spoken of the dark of this car park and of incidents that someone with a grudge to bear might take as provocation. What do you say to that? Mrs. Miller, didn't you welcome Ronnie Dewhurst's little attentions, both as a reminder of a happy past and as a distraction from a rather dull present? No. Did you ever particularly put a stop to them? No. Except I told David about the phone calls. Mrs. Miller, in the light of all we have just learned about your relationship past and present with Ronald Dewhurst, I would invite you to be completely open with us. Is not the truth of what happened in the car park that night closer to the version of Lorraine Dilts and Ronald Dewhurst, in that angered and sickened by the offensive jokes of a cheapskate comedian, having had a few drinks, and above all, being aware of the relationship between you and Ronald Dewhurst, your husband, on hearing Ronald Dewhurst laugh in the car park, lost his control uh, and beat him in a most violent and vicious way, hitting him with his fists and then picking him up and throwing him under a reversing car to finish the job off. No. No, it wasn't like that. Well, what was it like, Mrs. Miller? It was like I said. And like David would have said. Oh, I see. No, it was like I said, because that's what happened. Look, I want to say something. Ronnie and me were good friends. And we had a lot of good times together, it's true. But I'm a married woman now. And I love my husband. And such as she is, my daughter. I know David looks rough. And I know he's got a bit of a past, even though he never got caught. But he wouldn't do this. Put a man on crutches, cripple him for life. We've got one crippling of us, it is. Mrs. Miller, if it will help you, you may sit down. No, I've not finished. Perhaps I could have put a better stop to Ronnie, and he's always pestering me. No one knows him better than me, and what you would think when I didn't. But what I did has got nothing to do with Dave. He's the kindest and gentlest man I know. And I love him. 
He couldn't have done this. Well, I'm afraid I have to disagree with you, Mrs. Miller. Though, of course, I respect your loyalty to your husband. No further questions, my lord. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. You may stand down. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, although all the direct evidence you have heard in this case is related to a specific incident in July of this year, there are, I'm sure you'll agree with me, many strands running through the case that go back quite some time. Let us look at the case then from these two points of view. First of all, the incident on the night of 23rd of July in the pub car park. You have heard uh, Mr. Miller admit that he hit Ronald Dewhurst as hard as he possibly could. Now, you will have to judge just how hard that can be and what sort of damage that could cause. You have heard Mr. Miller concede that he is perfectly capable physically of lifting Mr. Dewhurst off the ground and throwing him under a reversing car. And indeed, in the past, he has felt like doing just that. Now, you have heard Mr. Dewhurst state quite categorically that that indeed was what Mr. Miller did that night. He picked him up off the ground and threw him under a reversing car. Now, in this, uh, Mr. Dewhurst is supported quite without reservation by Miss Dilks, who was present and saw it all. Now, against this, we have the word of David Miller and his wife. Now, Mr. Miller's reasons for denying that he threw Mr. Dewhurst under a car are clear enough. An assault as serious as this is likely to result in a prison sentence if proven. Mrs. Miller, you may feel, has little choice but to support her husband. They are married, and they have a severely handicapped child who depends on them both, and the law cannot compel her uh, to give evidence against her husband. On the other hand, you have now seen uh, what a large part Ronald Dewhurst has played in Mrs. Miller's life. We have heard of a long-standing courtship, uh, what has been described as an ideal match, indeed a near engagement. Mrs. Miller has spoken of a bond between herself and Mr. Dewhurst of a sort she finds it difficult to forget. Mr. Miller has told us that he was aware of the past close relationship between his wife and Mr. Dewhurst. Now you will have to judge how far this knowledge finally provoked Mr. Miller in the car park that night. Never at any point has Mr. Miller sought to deny his dislike of Ronald Dewhurst. You've heard described how from childhood Dewhurst has had this unfortunate inclination to provoke people. You've heard Mrs. Miller, who knows him well, wonder whether he would ever grow up. Both David Miller and his wife deny absolutely that Miller in any way assaulted Dewhurst beyond striking him one blow under great provocation. You have only the word of Dewhurst and that of his current girlfriend, Miss Dilks. And you may wish to ponder how reliable a witness she can be. But a deliberate and sustained assault took place. No one else saw it. Mr. Glover, the driver of the car, and immediately upon the scene when Dewhurst fell under the car, did not see anyone else in the vicinity of the accident. I put it to you that this whole assault, apart from one admitted blow, is a fabrication by Ronald Dewhurst. And I invite you to reject this very serious charge against David Miller. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is a complicated case upon which you now have to decide a verdict. Now, you have been told of the relationships, past and present, between the, uh, the various people in the case. And these questions of relationship and motive again cannot be reconciled. For example, one, did Miller find between his wife and Dewhurst a mutual bond that could have led him, Miller, to an eventual attack upon Dewhurst? Now, this is what the prosecution asks you to accept. Two, did Dewhurst feel such thwarted passion for Mrs. Miller and such a strong resentment of Miller? that when he brought upon himself injuries that uh, could be said to find their beginnings in a row between the two men, he took the opportunity of doing 
great harm to Miller by bringing this present charge against him. Now, that is what the defence asked him to accept. And next, you must put the correct and just value upon the testimony of the two chief women witnesses. You must decide between Miss Dilk's version of events and that of Mrs Miller. Now, remember that both women have a deep emotional involvement in the facts of this case, like the men. You must decide what effect this has upon their conflicting testimony. As for the other witnesses, though the testimony neither of uh, Mrs Machin nor Mr Harrison nor the evidence of Dr Williams can be decisive, they may shed important light for you on the truth of what happened in the car park. Now, with all the evidence put forward, you must be clear in your minds whether there's been any bias or misinterpretation, whether the truth has been told in full, in part, or not at all by any particular participant. And finally, I have one thing to say to you, and it's this. In this case, as in all others, the burden of proof is upon the prosecution. That's to say, it's for the, the prosecution to prove the accused guilty. It's not for the accused to prove his innocence. I hope you'll be able to reach a clear and unequivocal verdict. Will you now retire, elect a foreman to speak for you, and in due course, present us with your findings. The court will rise. <laughs> Members of the jury, will your foreman please rise? Please answer a simple yes or no to this question. Have you been able to reach verdict on the charge before you? Yes. Is it the verdict of you all? Yes. Do you find David Miller guilty or not guilty as charged? Not guilty. David Miller, the jury has found you not guilty of the serious charge against you. You're free to leave this court. <laughs>